I want to do a quick lightning round with our wonderful group here. Um, uh, I want to ask for you to give us in three words how you would define your leadership. Ellen, do you want to start? Okay, uh, three words. Performance, partnership, and passion. Performance, partnership, and passion. Okay, Irene? I'd say um, authentic, uh, servant leadership, and uh, golden rule. I believe very strongly that uh, leaders should treat others the way they want to be treated. Golden rule, all right. I want to keep these in mind as we have this discussion. Uh, last year, the Harvard Business Review declared that today's C-suite requires new skills, communication, collaboration, team building, multitasking, and empathy. Ellen, these skills used to be called soft skills, female skills, do you agree that they're essential to effective visionary leadership today, and which are the most important to you in your CEO role? So, you know, we need a combination of hard skills and soft skills to be successful, right? I mean, we gotta ex execute, we gotta perform, but we gotta bring people with us. And the biggest part about bringing people with us, I think, for me, is listening. I think the higher you get in a corporation, the more you have to listen and not talk, or listen first, I guess I should say. Because it's only by tapping the wonderful experiences and expertise of all of our people can we be successful. And you can't do that if you're telling them what to do every five minutes so they don't bother the boss, per your 1940s uh, example right. there, <laughs> Irene. And so I really do think that the soft skills, the the EQ side is equally as important as the IQ side is in today's world to be successful. Where, when did that transition take place? That listening became as important as it is? I think as the world has gotten more globally competitive and the pace um, and the information flow, information is no longer key, king, you know, makes you king, right? Information. Uh, flows, right? And so I do think that as the world has become faster paced, more connected, more global, um, that, that uh, and markets around the world are different than each other, that, that those skills become even more important. Now I want to ask uh, Irene about this too, because when we talked to Jim Norman, your chief diversity officer, he told us that when you started as CEO, you went around the globe, sat with different groups, listened to them, you know, it's not necessarily the first choice that a CEO would make to introduce themselves to the world is to sit back and listen. Not that you sat back. I'm sure you weren't sitting back. You're probably leaning forward. But <laughs> tell us about that, that that was your first idea of how to wrap your arms around this new position. I, I think we've all experienced the fact that those that are closest to the business usually know exactly what needs to be done. And in fact, it's often those that are higher at higher levels that get in the way of that as opposed to necessarily <laughs> enhancing it. I, it, it <laughs> uh, and that is, that is probably that is one of the most so important true. leadership lessons that we all <laughs> learn. But the reality is I chose to go around on a, on a listening tour around the world because I really did want to understand what had gone wrong with the company. We were in a turnaround situation. I wanted to understand what needed to be done. And I would say one of the greatest learnings that came out of that experience was the recognition that we needed to make, we were making too many decisions centrally in Chicago and not enough decisions based on input from our local managers. I'm sure many of you have read the story of uh, our Oreo in China. We were about to discontinue that item because we had chosen to introduce the American product with the American packaging and the American marketing campaign. And only by listening to our local managers did we come to understand that we needed a less sweet product, we needed flavors like green tea, we needed forms like wafer, and we now have a, a half a billion dollar business in China hmm. that was almost not there. So I believe very fervently in the power of listening and the impact that it can have on, on making better business decisions. Let's go, let's go back to that topic about uh, risk taking. I mean, you know, you came up to that point where you were going to do something in China that wasn't quite right. And you had to uh, confront that and reverse it and really listen to the culture. Uh, that cultural competency is so difficult to learn. And, you know, we find that almost on a country-by-country -country basis, you have to find your way. 
But back here in the US, where we're very comfortable with our culture and we know that's where we can really step out and take the most risks. And you know, you both have taken a lot of risks in your careers and also in your uh, current positions. You're dividing the company in two, Irene. That's, you know, I'm sure considered uh, to be out there in terms of a decision that you had to make. You have to deal with the street on it, you have to deal with your employees. How do you, and, and you know, I think there is a feeling that women, uh, one of the things that I love to see women role model is the ability to take that risk. Um, and so just talk to us a minute about risk taking. I mean, my question is, know. do you have a risk meter somewhere in you that lets you know what are the good risks and what are the bad risks? I wish we had risk meters. <laughs> I'd be a lot wealthier if that were the case. But yeah. I, I would say, um, I think there's no question. Um, I talk a lot about taking risks, because I think it's essential. You, you, you really, you can't steal second if your foot's still on first. And so I think there is right. no question. You have to be willing to, to lean out there. But you have to do your homework. In any of the risks that I have taken, whether in, in our case, the Cadbury acquisition, the decision to spin off our grocery business, um, we did lots of work and, and, and studied it. And at a certain point, of course, there's no amount of data that will tell you conclusively that a decision is the right one. But I think if you do your homework and you have your eye clearly on the opportunity and the prize, you can manage the risks and, and, and deal with some of the naysayers and some of the other issues that happen uh, on your way to the execution. How about you, Ellen? Talk to us about your risk taking and your, uh, either your career or something specifically with the company. Yeah, no, I, I think I would rather pull people back than try to push them. I think it's easier to pull people back than push them, right? Um, but you have to have the homework done. So it's the questions you ask, and you talk about different cultures, but the questions, you know, from a business standpoint are the same. Well, you know, let me see your marketing research. Let's, let's talk about it, share it with me. Let me hear what the market is saying, you know? And so I do think that um, risk is part of the equation. If you're standing still, you're going to get run over. And it's true in any company or any business in any marketplace I've ever worked in. Um, but it has to be calculated. I mean, we, we're a science company. We do some pretty tough stuff. And we have the confidence to do it because of the research that we've done and the testing that we've done and things like that that give us um, uh, an assuredness that it's not going to be a runaway reaction type of thing. And so I do believe that if we can get people to have that confidence that, well, and that I'm going to back them up on it too. It all doesn't work out well. Right. We make mistakes. I make mistakes. And it's not if we do, it's number one, where did we kind of get off track? And number two, what do you learn from it? The only bad mistake is one that you don't learn from so you avoid the next time. And I think those are the kinds of things we have to instill in the culture of our companies if we're going to be successful. The other thing I would say about risk taking is um, contingency planning is essential because mm -hmm. the facts are things will go wrong. <laughs> and it's much more productive to spend the time once you've made a decision thinking about what will go, potentially could go wrong mm -hmm. and how will you manage that as opposed to choosing not to do it because there might, something might happen. And so a lot of the issues, and, and they don't go perfectly, as Ellen said, we have lots of examples, but I think the ability to manage our way through those mishaps have a, everything to do with our ability to, to move forward. Do you find that you sometimes have to just though leap ahead and you know, take that leap and not look back too much? Otherwise, you oh, might I, I have a, I have a no regrets policy. If if I'm on a course, I'm not going to sit back and say, "Gee, I wish I hadn't," because I did. And right. then it's not about if you did; it's what you do about it, right? right. So you got to have a no regrets policy on. Well, I mean, the, the, the whole organization looks to you to understand whether we're going in the right direction. It is essential that if you make a decision. Yeah, you go. <laughs> you go, girl. You don't hesitate and say, gee. You just keep Maybe going. Not, you know. well, you one go, of, I'll be right there. One of the very interesting decisions that Ellen has made um, is to make sustainable growth her mission. Uh, she is working to reduce DuPont's environmental footprint. And so I'd like to ask what led you to, to focus on this, and how hard is it for a science company to go green? What, and well, actually, it's not hard. What you're doing. You know, so it's interesting because I, uh, I think we came at it early because of the type of company we were in the 70s and the 80s where we were a chemical company. Um, and we were under a lot of pressure. And so we did 
measure and reduce our footprint. And I mean, I'm really proud of the fact that we've reduced our carbon emissions by 72% um, since then. Mm. We've um, reduced our energy. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we've, <laughs> we've reduced our energy use 6% since 1990, but we've grown our volume 40% in that wow. time. And the interesting thing is my shareholders have benefited greatly of that because we avoided $6 billion, $6 billion in energy costs mm. over that time frame. Oh. So, but then we moved in the 2000s to uh, sustainability as a numerator as opposed to the denominator, reduce your footprint. Uh, how do we help our customers become more sustainable? How do we create advanced plastics that can withstand an application in the powertrain of a car and actually outlast metals and reduce a hundreds of pounds lighter and you get higher fuel economy. Hmm. So that's helping the automotive industry become more sustainable. So in the 2000s, we shifted it to be a numerator equation. How can we make the world a safer place? How can we protect people and the environment? So, and I, you get so much energy from our people about it. And we go out to recruit and they start, ask, these kids these days, they ask you about that. They wanna work for a company who they're proud of and who they see doing great things. And when you have that kind of focus in the company, it, it creates a tremendous amount of energy. Congratulations on doing it. I'm, well, I fun. was flabbergasted when I heard that. that well, I know, I think if we're gonna be here for our 300th birthday, we're 210 years old. Um, if we're gonna be here for our 300th birthday, we're gonna be a very different company than we were at our 200th birthday. And everyone, has to help in making that happen. But you know, I, I, think, I think sustainability is very much like the NAFI mission in that mm. you can do well by doing good. It, it, it really, for us, it was not till we got to the point where we could demonstrate that we could save money, that we could actually increase our supply mm -hmm. of our agricultural commodities, for example, that we could really get people mm. inspired about it. Because otherwise, when it was simply an altruistic mission, it becomes very difficult to keep people on board and to keep the energy going. And I think similarly, as we've talked about the need for women in executive positions, the, 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 it's a business imperative. It's not about mm. something that's simply a nice to do and sustainability is very much the same. And it's also about the customers. I mean, we hear from our readers all the time how important sustainability is to them. They really believe, they look, that they, look they take a very long range view of the world because they're moms and they want the world to be a good place for their grandchildren, not just for them or for their children. And I think you'll get, you get and everybody in this room that's working on sustainability gets such uh, you know, tremendous energy from the consumer on this topic. Go ahead, Betty. Um, at the round table this morning, we focused on how women leaders can speed the, the advancement of women, which is what uh, my little segue from what Irene was just saying. Um, your women senior managers, Irene, jumped from 25% to 36% from 2010 to 2011. And so could you share with, with the people in this room what changes you've led that have brought about this 44% increase? Well, I, I think you said it earlier, what gets measured gets done. And I, I actually referred to it uh, in my remarks as well. We made it part of our senior executive's compensation. And That's when it. one does that, it just becomes uh, much more front and center it, it's something that is part of an evaluation and, and that's how you make the progress. So it's helped us in our advancement planning conversations, it's helped us in our pipeline discussions and it's helped us certainly ultimately in the end result which is making progress on a critical initiative. Counting, counting. measuring. Counting. That's yes. why we asked for the numbers. Money. <laughs> yes. It's always, about, it's always about the money. Um, Ellen DuPont uh, also achieved that amazing thing that I was talking <coughs> about before, being the, the only one of these fabulous group of companies in here that has a greater percentage of women senior managers than your employees' base which would suggest. So obviously I have to work on the base. Ah, get that up, yeah. right? That will be fabulous. Get that up, that right? will be fabulous and we hope more women are moving into these. I gotta, gotta create another, raise the bar again. Yeah. Um, for, with you it's, it's that your women are 26% of employees and 34% of senior managers. So how did, how did you achieve that? 
know, I, I uh, so I benefited from it. I mean, because my predecessor, Chad Holliday, was very focused on creating a very diverse workforce and one where we all felt comfortable in succeeding and achieving. So, I mean, I was brought up in a DuPont that that was kind of the mantra. And so how do we continue it? How do we make it stronger? I mean, because we're recruiting in biotechnology, in engineering, in, in a lot of the science fields. And, you know, OK, so good. When they see me, they think, wow, maybe they can succeed at DuPont and all the women want to work there, which, you know, I do recruit a lot. You know, I spend a lot of time at universities telling you know, them how great DuPont is because I want their great kids, right? And so I do think that we have to model it and we have to be very true to it. But it is about the numbers. You have to measure it. And you got to make it a carrot as opposed to a mm -hmm. stick, right? Mm -hmm. And the stick means if I create a stick, then my great women in my polymers business will never get a chance to be developed by going into the electronics business because the polymers leader doesn't want to take a hit on their numbers. So you got to have to, how do you make it so that you're creating momentum and creating an incentive for them to, to take, to lose their good women and to get them higher develop, more highly developed so they can take on more and more leadership responsibility. So you have to create that carrot in there for it. That's a, that's a really important point. Our, our diversity performance factor is on top of your base bonus. It is not a, a, in, a, lieu a, a in lieu of your mm -hmm your base. Mm -hmm. And so there's real value in providing that incentive over and above as opposed to making it a, a stick. I, I would agree with that. I want to ask about work-life balance. I mean, wherever we go and we talk to women about their careers, there's an intrinsic uh, uh, lacing together of benefits and support services that help women be allowed to have children and jobs and careers at the same time. It's together. You can't separate these two. Um, and of course, people are curious about how you, uh, you know, balance work and life with your very, very busy jobs. And you're both moms. You have three kids. Irene has two. Uh, you still have high schoolers. I are just graduating this, this May, right? They are. Hopefully. Uh, yes. Twins. Twins. Cross those twins fingers. They're boys. And they're cross boys. So you might yeah. have to cross your fingers. <laughs> yeah. They're good. They're good. I had they're all, they and all of their friends are coming over. For yeah, barbecue. I got 93 people showing up at my house tonight. The entire lacrosse team, their coaches, and their parents for the opening dinner. Woohoo! So. All right. And if you need some help, us. we'll all come over. Yeah, and yeah. Help you clean up afterwards. So my <laughs> question is, you know, Yes, we want to know how you do it, but also, how, what do you say to working mothers about how they can do it? Because everybody's in different circumstances, and those of us who have a lot of, you know, access to help and support, it's one thing, but what about the average working mother? What do you feel is really the most important thing for them to, to know about? Well, I mean, okay, so I'll take issue with the word balance, because I'm not sure that's an appropriate word. I mean, there's no balance in my life. My kids have issues during the work day. My work has issues at night and on weekends, and I gotta figure it out. And what works for Irene might not work for me or vice versa, because we each have a different family situation or the community we live in has different kinds of services or not. And so what I keep saying is what worked for me might not work for you, I'm more than willing to share it, but we, we gotta help each other figure it out. Um, and for my women at plants, it might come in that, the, that we need to do some things around daycare if our shift starts early um, for, you know, and so it depends on the community. But I think this idea of balance is, well, I don't know. Do you have any balance in your let me, life, Let me just, let Irene? me Irene? Because if you no. do, help me. <laughs> help me here. Because I'm not, I, uh... I'll give you a couple other words. You can use work-life integration. You can oh, yeah. use work-life harmony. Yeah. But I want to make a statement here, which yeah. is that... The average woman in this country yeah. thinks about whether there's balance in her life so that she can well, feel comfortable. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a funny example, um, well, I, I, and funny in terms of what I learned about it later. When I had my twins, when my twins were 18 months old, my daughter was five and a half, and I was running our TI2 business, $2 billion business, thousands of employees, huge integrated sites, very, very a hazardous process, right? Um, and my boss lived in Japan. Mm. And so 
um, I, our deal was that when I, I'd get the kids home, we'd, we'd talk every other week. I'd get the kids home, put them to bed, and then we'd video conference. I had a little, this is like 100 years ago, video conferencing, put it in my house um, so I could chat with him. And then it dawned, and so this is 9 o'clock at night. Then it dawned on me. It's 9 a.m. for him. What the hell was that about? I mean, but I mean, so, hey, here he is being so, he, I, I was thinking, God, he's being so flexible with me. And then I'm realizing, wait a minute, it's 9 p.m. for me. He's in That's the great. office. But, um, but it actually worked out better for me because it gave me the flexibility with my day. And once I could get home, feed the kids, get them to bed and work a couple more hours, right? I mean, and that worked for me. Yeah. But I mean, you got to, and, so and there's so many better tools these days to communicate than there ever was. It's true. You know, I, I know there's been a big debate as to whether PDAs are a help or a yes, hindrance. Right. Yes, it, it, They're a help. I, I, I remember years ago going to soccer games where every quarter I'd run to my car to, 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 to check my messages. And um, I mean, I think the ability to recognizing, as Ellen said, it doesn't all work neatly that the work issues happen on Monday through Friday and the family issues happen on the weekends. The ability to understand what is important to you, what needs to get done to develop a support system that can accomplish that. I think I talk to many women about what sorts of child care arrangements they need to have, what sorts of elder care arrangements they need to have. And it's all about what is the nature of your life, your schedule, and then what can work best for you given those issues. I think the reality is for many working women, uh, particularly those of us in the kind of jobs we're talking about here, we have the opportunity to afford investment in some of these uh, support yes, services, yeah. which is a critical enabler, uh, and it has been certainly for me in, 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 in the course of my career. But I think it's important to understand what is important, what needs to get done, and to, to figure out how you can accomplish right. that. But with the tools that we have today, it is so much easier to be flexible about where you are, when you accomplish the uh, tasks, and, uh, and particularly in a global workplace, everybody is dealing with work-life challenges. Right. So I do think it's something that we as a society are needing to wrestle with in a much bigger way than perhaps yeah. we needed two years yes. ago. See, I agree. I, you know, I was lucky and a lot of the people I work for as I was building my career never once questioned my work ethic mm. and gave me flexibility on how and where I got my work done. And that was something that hit me as my kids were little that I really try to practice today. It, you don't, you know, you don't measure somebody's uh, the 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 value of their work by the number of hours they're sitting in an office, right? Or that they send me an email at 11 p.m. As a matter of fact, I tell half of them I think you should shut off the email at 10 p.m. You know, unless there's an it's emergency. Bothering you. You know, because you're, you're waking me up. But um, <laughs> exactly. And I think you need more sleep than you know. And so I think I really try to not use the amount of time, the face time, as an indicator of performance. It's about what gets done in the role. And if you do it from home, this or that, go to your kid's soccer game or lacrosse game in my case, you know, come back, whatever works for you. But at the end of the day, the work's got to get done, right? Absolutely. But I also, the other advice I would give to all of you is be honest. I think too often mm. we're given assignments, no, you know, you're afraid to push back. And so you find yourself in an untenable position when in fact, if you had just said, I can't have it by today, is Monday okay? I can't have it by tonight, will tomorrow yes. be okay? Invariably, you will hear the answer, yes, that's fine. And so the other thing I always advise yeah, our women to do is, is to, if there's yes. a better way to do it that would, would be easier for them to accommodate, to ask for what you want. And, and I think you will find most good leaders and certainly in today's environment, are absolutely aware of the, oper of the challenges, anxious to try to help you accommodate your life and, and the work, and they will work with you. And I think you will find that uh, to be the case more often than not. Thank you. Betty, you get the last question. We are almost out of time, so very quickly from both of you, what is the most important piece of advice that you could give to the women in this room to propel their success? I, for me, it was the advice I got from my predecessor as I took on the CEO role. Be yourself. You perform so much better when you're you as opposed to trying to be what I or anybody else want you to be. Mm. That's much better advice than we heard last night who, somebody, who said somebody gave them the advice, don't screw up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but no, I, 
might help too. You never know. It might help. Too. Right. I, would say, um, I would say be yourself. Critically important. The other thing I might add is make a difference, regardless of what level in, in an organization you are you are occupying. If you focus yourself on making a difference, make sure that that position is better for your having been there. That's how you will move along. And and uh, it certainly was advice that uh, has served me well over the course of my career. Wow. Join Thank me you. in thanking these Huge wonderful women. Huge round of women. applause. Uh, my role models. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Irene, thank you so much. What a joy.